Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Masterclass for Business Professionals. My name is Asha Claxton. First and foremost, you know, this Masterclass was really born out of understanding that people somehow lost their core. You know, we work with teams as leaders, we work with teams as colleagues, even in our homes, and the love the tenets of what we, the foundational elements, I think it has just gone missing. So you are here as that touch point to bring it back. You may be in a relationship and in a relationship, yes, you have interpersonal communication, which becomes two way communication. But in that communication module, you're speaking to yourself about the relationship. Has anybody here ever wondered, you know, how is it they are able to go through a conversation even though the conversation had ended? Anybody here does that? You've never done that before? Oh no, you don't do those things, right? Somehow, you would have a conversation with someone. What about if it's a really intense conversation? Men with the woman, you know, women always, that woman always write conversation, that part. You know, and you are trying to figure out in your mind how that conversation went. How did we reach this point? That actually is called punctuating. We punctuate, we, we go through the conversations over and over in our mind and we determine where we were right, woman. And we determine where we were wrong, men. That's actually just very funny, okay? No, no, it doesn't, have, it doesn't happen like that. We're both right and wrong. But that allows us to process the information in a way that we could understand. What are you good at? Have you ever considered that you're good at things outside your job? And what have you done about it? Have you considered that you can be a better individual to your spouse? And what have you done about it? Have you considered that you can be a better coworker? And what have you done about it? Have you considered that you could be a better leader? And what have you done about it? So when we talk about intrapersonal communication, it's really managing our communication, communication with self, and then it actually travels into, as I said prior, interpersonal communication. Interpersonal communication defined is communication between a sender and a receiver. This time the receiver is not you. The receiver is someone else on the next end. And that person is sent or you are given or receive a message through a medium with a measure of feedback. How do we communicate with others? Emotional intelligence, the objective of it is intrinsic and extrinsic emotional satisfaction achieved by emotional expression and emotional regulation. So in talking about the skills of expression and regulation so that we do have external and internal emotional satisfaction because that's what we want ultimately out of life in any area, I would imagine. So what does it mean for us to mind our gap? So I'd like to conceptualize for you or invite you to join me in conceptualizing self in some specific ways. Emotional intelligence exists in the part of our brain that's plastic, so it means that we can increase our emotional intelligence, we can increase our compassion. And one more idea here about compassion, and that is when we are compassionate with each other, parts of our brain that are responsible for pleasure lights up and oxytocin is released. That's one of those helpful, happy neurotransmitters. So self wants to be validated, and when we are able to do that for ourselves, we're able to do that for others. Another idea about self, and I mentioned it before, is that we're under the constant threat of stress. And stress comes in multiple ways, but before we talk about what happens to the body when we're in that fight, flight, or freeze, I'd just like to touch on some of those areas that stress comes from. Asha mentioned some of them before. It comes from our multiple roles. Who in the room is part of the sandwich generation? You're taking care of your own children as well as aging parents. 
right, who are the caregivers in the room. Stress comes from those intimate relationships. They come from the difficult colleagues. They come from the difficult conversations that we have to have at work. Stress comes from managing our own illness or wellness, physical, mental, emotional, as well as being there to support others. It's said to open our lock, we must communicate because it is a key. Communication is the heart of any profession. As individuals or as professionals, it is perceived that we get our points across or ideas across and everyone understands. But communication, I think, is a challenge for anyone. It is said that accountancy sets itself apart from any other profession because of the need to communicate clearly and concisely to users of financial information, both internally and externally of the organization. Communication and accounting are two intertwined concepts that play a crucial role in the success of any business or organization. It is a crucial aspect of the accounting process. However, it should be noted that the processes and media used by accountants and financial experts to communicate accountability, accountability or accounting information to represent or misrepresent the financial positions of entities. What I have found in my profession is that with the latest technology, we have to pay more attention to the written word because the accountant, I think soon accountants will be a thing of a past. I think with technology and the advent of technology, where our strength lie is really transforming or communicating that data into that something is more palatable to organizations or to our stakeholders. I'll give you a personal situation. There was a situation whereby I sent an email and I didn't realize that I sent it in caps. And I got a phone call and somebody told me I was shouting at them. And I'm like, shouting? So I told the person, I didn't speak to you for the day, so how could I be shouting at you? They said, through the email. So I'm like, the email? So I went back and looked at the email and to me, the email was fine. Only to behold, they say, when you put things in bold or block letters, it means that you are shouting at the individual. So there's something that you have to learn. I want to ask a question. How many of us here are not afraid to speak in public? Dana? All right, excellent. The reason why I'm asking that question is because there's a myth, and the myth is that man's greatest fear is the fear of death. It's not the fear of death. Man's greatest fear is what I'm doing right now. As a matter of fact, some people would rather die than come up here to do a presentation and to speak because you get so scared and you get that nebulous feeling. From the moment I said, I'm going to call somebody to come up here i'm sure everyone's stomach began to turn and i'm sure some of the women saying he better don't call me you know? yeah. one of the things i wanted to start by sharing is a story of my own life i was going to kill myself when i was 19 years this is a true story huh? i'm not making this up i was going to kill myself when i was 19 years old and this was not one of those write a note, um, try to blame somebody, it's my mother's fault. No. I was definitely going to kill myself. The only person that knew that I was going to kill myself was God. And there's a reason why I'm telling you that, because my wife is here, and I've been liking my wife since I was 15 years old. And at 19, I was going to kill myself. I was with her for four years already, and she had no idea that I was going to kill myself. My father died when I was nine, and that affected me a lot, and it was part of the reason why I wanted to kill myself. And my mother, at 19 years, had no idea that I was going to kill myself. My best friend, who is still my best friend today, who is my best friend from since I was seven years old, had no idea that I wanted to kill myself. The only person that knew that I wanted to kill myself was God. And the reason why I'm telling you that is because 
At 19 years, I did not want to hear anything about God. My mother made me go to church. And I went to church out of just sheer respect for her. But I didn't want to hear anything about God because when I went to church, I had to hear the pastors preach and say, oh, the Lord loves you and cares for you. And he's willing to supply all your needs according to his riches. And I was not seeing any of that. But the reason why I'm telling you that story is this. On. 31 years ago, on that night, God saw me speaking to you here today. <laughs> Purpose. And I know that I was supposed to speak here today because when Asha came to me, I immediately accepted. And why did I do that? Why did I immediately accept? Because I wanted to talk about public speaking. And I wanted to talk and address not the normal stuff that they talk about with public speaking, huh? Any of you could Google right now how to become a prolific public speaker and you'll get 10 things, 10 ways, five ways, etc., etc. One of the things it says in the Bible is that David encouraged himself. And we have to get to a point where you not depend on someone per se to come and encourage you, but you have to now talk to yourself and say, Hey, Stephen, you can do this. Hey, Stephen, this is not as hard as you think it is. And this is one of the ways that I comforted myself in church. I said, you know what? 97% of the people sitting out there are too scared to do what I'm doing right now. And because of that, I'm going to come up here, and I'm not going to feel like I'm better than you or dominating you in any way. But the fact that I'm up here and I'm doing this right now means that I'm strong. It means that I'm brave. It means that I did it. I pushed forward. I, I, I made the effort and I didn't run away because I'm telling you, and you all know this, I'm going to call one of you just now. I'm going to call one of you just now. And every time I make that statement, I'm sure your stomach is going, mm -hmm. but you have to confront the fear. And you have to comfort yourself. You have to tell yourself, you have to talk to yourself and say, hey, you got this. I'm telling you, if we wait for people to do that to us, because what happens is people can come and tell you, be strong. Take courage. God is going to work out everything. When they are not in the situation. It's easy to come and tell somebody, don't worry. Don't worry. Everything is going to work out when they are not in the situation. So you now have to say, no, you know what? I got this and I am brave. One of the, things that, one of the other things that I've done is because of what God said to me on that night when I was going to kill myself, that is my forever anchor. So even when I came here today, I'm like, don't forget, you said you're going to be with me always. And I want you to be with me this afternoon as well. I like to say protocol is an art and it's a science. Because it, it's an art because you have to use wisdom. It's a science because there are specific rules and guidelines that you must follow. So this is something I noticed that, I don't know if it's COVID, but... Um, could I use your hand as an example? You could use hand sanitizer after, but so, so women, right, so this is the best handshake, very firm. I see you probably trained in the military or something, but, <laughs> but women started to do this. So it give me, like, limp your hand like this, and they do, like, like this. I don't know if it's COVID, but it's something that is a little disrespectful, and people have found it to be almost off-putting when they, when they receive that end of a, of a shake hand. As I said, it, it could have been COVID where people don't want to do the full hand, but it just, it just gives you like, okay, this person is either scorning you, they don't want you to touch you, they, they, they don't think highly of you. So I think that's just something we need to be mindful of, even something as simple as shaking hands. 
And of course, beware of cultural practices. I went to an event in Barbados recently, and I guess because maybe they may not have as many Muslims or, is, or, or people of that faith, so they were very quick to shake and touch the Muslim lady who was in full hijab, and she, she pulled back. And because, of course, that's not, there's no gender crossing when you're greeting, um, as particularly if they, you know the, it's a Muslim, and it's a woman, and, and you know that, and she's in full garb. You, you don't do that kind of greeting. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Thokozile James. I was asked to speak on innovation and strategy. So what is innovation? Innovation is the process by which a domain, a product, or a service is renewed and brought up to date by applying new processes, introducing new techniques, or establishing successful ideas to create value. And I think in a lot of our identifications, even around the world when it comes to technologies being innovative, we forget that factor of creating value. So many years ago, before blinds were, were, um, were a thing, they invented the part of the, the um, you know, the electronic part that could make blinds open and close, and it was a hazard. It sold a lot, it was a hazard. But did they really solve a problem? No, they just saw that there was a product and they, and they created it. So the first question is, how do we define what innovation is to us. So I had to create my own core values as a business person, what that meant to me. And for us and my organization, it meant, back to what Asha had said, a desire to serve. In any, in any part of us being innovative, there must be a desire to serve. There must be a desire to help someone else. There must be a desire to give back. Me deciding to do this today, as much as I wanted to say no, the first thing that Asha said was, we are giving back to people. This is a free conference. This is a conference that, we're, that we are going to share what our values. We're going to share what we know. And this is why I decided to. The second thing is to make a connection. Just as Asha said again, we as a people, are, as technology grows, the further and further apart we are get, we are becoming in terms of how we communicate and our connectivity is, when it should be better, it's so much worse. The other point is adding value, which we just mentioned, and the final point is making an impact. When you see what's going on in other people's life, that's really you, you know. It's just a matter of circumstance that it's really not you. This morning, I spoke to a man who you know, caught Shamrock, if you know San Fernando. That's where he was. He used to come and eat out the dustbins and live on the street, whatever, da da da. Today the man is all cleaned up or whatever. We tried to help him by the church and all of those things. And the truth is, when you listen to their story, it just says, My father died at nine, my mother left me at 13. I didn't have anywhere to go. I said, Look, you realize how close you were that a parent dies and a parent leaves and here you are for 30 something years of your life looking for food and clothes on the street so don't look at them like they're some kind of story out of a, that's that's me so i've learned to be real patient with people i wasn't like all oh, sorry that eh? i feel change formula change my father taught me be patient with people because that's you there Listen, be a little, because here's what happened. When you help Egypt, you're helping Egypt to get out of them, you know. It's not just them changing, you know. You, didn't, you never used to love like that until you had to help somebody come up. So even you're changing. I grew up in the church. I used to judge people when I went through a broken engagement, right? I end up in strip clubs, clubs. I drink every day except Sunday. I don't know why I leave on Sunday. <laughs> what do you don't judge me? I just say, yeah, I wasn't drinking. But every other day, look what you're doing in there. Your pastor's son, and you grow up in the church. Why are you just fall apart like that? And you know what he said is so true. The, peop the, the only people I didn't want to see when I was going through that is church people. 
I hear the worst things about me. But you know who accepted me? The people in all them places. <laughs> when I sit down by the bar, it's when we sit down by the bar, I say, yeah, you still go to church too? I, used to... I say, well, is a, is a whole crew here? <laughs> This is the Bible. This is when the night Bible study here. We just get through, through to the side. And I realized all these people went through hard times, but no people are not patient with those who are suffering or struggling. You are rarity when you take time to really love somebody and listen to them. I stand before you as a product of everything probably neglected because I've been on my own since I was 15 years old and I didn't have to answer to anybody everything bad you could think I do you can look me up now everything bad that somebody could do I probably do it I did it but I remember somebody saying to me are you a leader or a follower? Because with a leader, it doesn't matter where you start. It matters only where you finish. And so today, I impart that to you. Finish well. Thank you again for coming. Thank you for staying with us. Would you join us for our next masterclass when we have it? Would you recommend us going forward? Thank you so much. God bless you and have a great night.